The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Northeast Conference on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, I would like to welcome you to our special webinar to support educators in this unprecedented time of emergency closure due to COVID-19. This afternoon's webinar is entitled, Language Learning After Corona, Lessons Learned as We Move Forward. This webinar has been generously sponsored by Wayside Publishing. Please visit waysidepublishing.com for more information about how Wayside can assist with your remote teaching and learning needs. My name is John Carlino, NECTFL Executive Director, and I will be hosting this afternoon's webinar along with NECTFL 2020 Chair Nathan Lutz and NECTFL Board member, member Jimmy Wildman as moderators. We are grateful to our presenter, Rebecca Aubrey, for offering us her time and expertise. <coughs> this webinar will be recorded. A link to the recording will be posted to our website at nectful.org slash webinars as soon as it is available. This webinar is scheduled to last one hour with 45 to 50 minutes devoted to the pre presenter. The remaining time will serve as Q&A with the presenter to answer your questions. Attendees are encouraged to submit your questions during the webinar using the question feature of the GoToWebinar control panel on the side of your screen. Our moderators will organize these questions and will share them with the presenter during the presentation and or at the end. In the event of technical difficulties, please remain connected as you are able. If the technical difficulties are on your end, please contact GoToMeeting Customer Support for assistance. If you're having difficulty with sound, click on Phone Call under Audio in the control panel and call in with the number provided. And now, please let me take this opportunity to introduce you to our presenter, Rebecca Aubrey. Rebecca received her BA in Human Ecology from the College of the Atlantic, her MA in Political Science from the University of Connecticut, and a teaching certification through the Connecticut Alternate Route to Certification. She has over 20 years of teaching experience at the college level and 10 years of experience teaching Spanish in grades K through 8. Rebecca has pres presented broadly in Connecticut and at the national level, including two ACTFL presentations. She is the 2019 ACTFL Teacher of the Year. Rebecca is passionate about exploring the cultural and linguistic diversity of our world and equally passionate about empowering students to do the same. Rebecca, thank you for sharing your time with us. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much, John. And um, thank you to everyone who's taken the time out of their day to attend. I, I don't know how you're all feeling at this point, but this has been a very exhausting spring. And I admire those of you who are still giving up uh, time in your day to continue to learn and collaborate with other language teachers. I also really wanted to thank you, John, for not only the work that you've done in this webinar series, but the work that you consistently do for NECTFL. Um, I don't know how many of you out there know John, but he is an incredibly organized and patient and detailed oriented person. And he does so much to support these webinars and to help ensure that they flow very smoothly. So thank you, John. Well, you're welcome, but you're making me blush, but it, it's it's not just me. It's the it's the team behind me, our NECTFL board of directors and, and their very capable leadership as well. Yes, and so I would also like to thank NECTFL and Wayside Publishing for supporting this series and supporting language learners, language educators during this very challenging time. Um, I would also like to thank my two facilitators that we have here, Nathan Lutz and Jimmy Wildman. Nathan is an elementary French teacher in New Jersey, and he is the past president of NEL and also on the NECTFL board of directors. And Jimmy Wildman, who teaches Spanish at Glastonbury High School and is my colleague here in Connecticut on the Connecticut Council of Language Teachers and also on the NECTFL board. Um, Jimmy actually was the person who reached out and invited me to participate in this webinar. And I was so delighted that he and Jimmy are my facilitators. But one of the things that I, I said to, the, to both of them was that um, 
I really wanted to make this an interactive webinar. And so I invite all of you listening at any time to uh, post your questions, post your comments, but I'd, I'd like to get us as much as we can virtually interacting and sharing with each other. So I'm delighted to have the two of them along to help me. When Jimmy asked me about participating in this webinar, um, I was very excited to do so, but I also was at a point where I was feeling very tired of the chaos that Corona threw us into, both personally trying to be a parent, educating my child from home, but also to be able to continue to support my students with languages through distance learning. And all I thought about was, uh, I want things to go back to normal. And um, so the purpose of this webinar is to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've learned through this distance learning process that are lessons we can apply when things eventually do go back to normal. So I want to invite you to show your ideas. I've created a Padlet, and I'd also encourage you to tweet anything out. Um, those of you who like to multitask, you have two different things that you can work on here as, as we move forward. Um, all that being said, I do just want to take a pause and say that there are a lot of things that have been happening recently, and it's not just Corona, but that there are some things that just can't go back to normal. And that in this time, you know, in the wake of the George Floyd murder, there have been a lot of protests and a lot of awareness raised about the systematic racism that occurs against people of color. Um, you know, the discrimination, violence, microaggressions, and implicit biases. And these are things that we need to make sure that we continue to talk about and are things that just can't go back to normal. And I'm sharing here a photo of my daughter who has participated in several protests. And I just, in her name, wanted to make sure that we are speaking up for that. And I regret that I, I don't want to seem to be glossing over the topic. It wasn't the purpose of this webinar, but I would feel remiss if I didn't mention that there are some things that cannot go back to normal. So that being said, when Jimmy invited me to do this session, I um, continue to engage and talk to a lot of different language educators, both in my school and beyond, and kind of settled around a range of topics that I thought were important and valuable to talk about today. One is I feel like through this process of distance learning, we've learned a lot about new technologies and new ways to use technologies that we were already using. And I think these are lessons that we can continue to apply. Um, I have found a lot of teachers talking about how they have really learned to plan with more focus and more purpose. And I think some of us brings us back to our teacher training and are just some really good reminders for what what things we learned when we were uh, in training to become teachers that we just need to remind ourselves of and reapply. Um, another piece is providing some effective feedback. Uh, a lot of teachers have found that they are learning a lot about this during this process. Uh, teaching the whole child how we can ensure the overall well being of the students that we work with. And I've heard of a lot of teachers talking about new ways that they've learned to collaborate with other language educators. And so these are some of the topics that I plan to cover in this webinar. So beginning by talking about technology, um, I wanted to share with you kind of two of my technology highlights, two of my technology favorites and how I've been using them, but also how I've heard other language educators using them. And I'm gonna just, um, I understand there's some feedback on my on my mic. So while I switch out, um, Nathan, I know that you are a big advocate for Seesaw. So Seesaw has a reputation for being used a lot in the elementary grades. It is a web-based program that allows students to reply to different types of prompts. Uh, it keeps a student journal, sings very nicely with Google Classroom. Uh, while I switch out my mic, Nathan, would you be willing to share a minute what are some of the things that you do with Seesaw? Sure, I'd love to. Um, Seesaw is a wonderful tool that's used in many elementary schools. It has definitely helped my school get through teaching during the pandemic. Uh, it, it allows students to be agents of their own learning where they're able to 
receive complete and complete tasks all on their own without any parent help whatsoever. And they can even get feedback from the teacher. Uh, students can write, they can draw, they can annotate on something, they can take pictures, or they can shoot video of themselves uh, and make voice recordings. And for me, I used it so much in having my students speak about their activities rather than just completing worksheets or other written things that aren't quite as robust. And I can also Great. give Thank verbal you. feedback to them. Yes. Thank you, Nathan. I, I hope that's a little bit better. Um, so, I, you know, the things I like about Seesaw also is that it gives students a lot of choice in how they respond. The photo that you see here on my screen are some benchmark questions that we gave students in my district at the beginning of the school year, and I just gave them at the end of the school year. I, you see my little bit emoji on the left, I asked students a question and they then responded to the question. Some of my students just recorded a voice response. Some of my students wrote something out and then responded to it. Um, this particular student actually went and found matching bitmojis to go with each of the ones that I posted. And so I just find by giving students choice in how they're responding to the question, it just engages them and brings them in more. And Jimmy, I know what you're sitting there thinking that this is an elementary school thing and it's not. Um, I really worked hard to sell Seesaw in my district. Uh, we are teaching languages from first grade all the way up to 12th grade. I got middle school teachers using it. And I even have a high school AP teacher who is totally sold on it. He was telling me about how he's using it to help students prepare for the AP exams by asking, um, you know, some giving them speaking prompts that mimic what they might have to do on the AP exam, like making cultural comparisons. He has students doing dictations. He also um, can provide students with authentic resources, like authentic readings, newspaper articles, or authentic uh, radio recordings from France, and then has the students responding to some comprehension and, and um, questions and analyzing what they're seeing and hearing. And what he's really liked about it is because he saw functions as a portfolio, he's able to, and, and I see the same benefit, he's able to provide them with some comments on their work. They then do an, their next assignment and he's able to provide them comments again. So it maintains a portfolio and a record of students' proficiency growth. Um, my students were really excited to see their growth on these benchmark questions where at the beginning of the year when they were asked the questions they all said they didn't know and they didn't know they didn't know they didn't know they answered the question and several of my students students commented this week when they were asked the same questions again commented that they were so impressed to see that they were able to actually do so much more because this was their first year of Spanish for this group. My other big technology go-to has been Pear Deck. Um, Pear Deck is an add-on that you can get for Google Slides. It, the best tools you get with a subscription, but it's something that syncs very well with uh, Google Classroom. And basically the way it works is that you can take a Google Slideshow and add in these Pear Deck add-ons where you can ask students questions. That could be multiple choice questions, an open-ended response question. You see this photograph here, the image of, of these drag the dots questions. Um, you can embed videos in it and get uh, comprehension on the videos. And so it's kind of like some of the things that you could do with Edpuzzle where you have students watching an authentic resource but then responding to questions, but you can add so much more to it. Uh, Pear Deck has just added a new tool that lets you provide students with feedback on the, their answers to the different questions. You can also add in voice notes. And if we think about this moving forward, I was talking with some of my colleagues the other day about how great this can be for sub plans once we're back in school. And you think about how it's often a struggle for a language teacher to find something meaningful for students to do when we're not in the building. Why not take a Google Slideshow that you might already be using in the class and turn it into something interactive that students can do independently, even if you're not there. I know that the Bitmoji classrooms have been a really big hit 
uh, in the last couple of weeks, one of my colleagues who teaches seventh grade French and Spanish, Robin Bertrand, got really into designing her Bitmoji classroom. And she found it to be very useful now during distance learning as a way to organize resources for students. It's something that you can uh, do in a Google slideshow and just make it interactive. So students click on different parts and it takes them to different places. And one of the things Robin commented is that this is something she absolutely plans to use when things quote go back to normal because she found it to be so much more interactive and engaging for students than some of the more traditional packets that she might usually do. She found that students were a lot more engaged with it because it wasn't necessarily some of the rote writing work that she used to do in the past. She also really appreciated how through this technology, she's able to give students different choices and how they produce work for her. And so these are just some of the highlights from some of the people that I spoke with. I wanted to you know, ask Jimmy and Nathan if there are any cool technologies that you discovered or if you had some insights into this and what people might be sharing in the chat. Well, I think one of the questions that we've had was if we could um, share the link to the to the Padlet. So it's great that it's right here on the screen again so that everyone can go ahead and use that. Um, and we do have a couple of questions. Um, one of them, and I'm not sure if it would be best for Rebecca or for Nathan, actually, it was um, about syncing Seesaw with Google Classroom um, and how that can be done. So I can answer that and Nathan can throw his two cents in. Um, the way that syncing works is that if you're setting up your classrooms in Seesaw, it will automatically import your students from Google Classroom. So it facilitates the setup of um, setting up your classes in, in Seesaw. It then, when I post an assignment in Seesaw, it doesn't, it, you can have it post to your Google Classroom. I typically just in Google Classroom tell the students to go to Seesaw and complete this assignment. And so that's kind of how that that syncing works for me. I don't know if you use Google Classroom, Nathan. I dogs decided to bark after being quiet. Um, <laughs> we do not use Google Classroom. We have a different course management system at my school. Uh, my school purchased the Seesaw for Schools program, which allows students to toggle between all of the different subjects that they have which has been really helpful for our youngest students who have perhaps less technology aptitude uh, for changing accounts and you know, different passwords and logins. So that's been extremely uh, great you know, for them to just take agency over their own work. That's great. Any other neat technologies anyone wanted to share or new ways or any questions? We do have a couple of questions about the Bitmoji classrooms and if there's a special app for that. Um, and the answer to that, um, I can, I would be happy to share because I've also created one. The answer to that is no. Um, those classrooms are usually made in Google Slides um, and then you can add links to them and such. So um, if you're looking for a great summer project, you can actually find lots of videos on them on YouTube on how to make them. Cool. Jimmy, what kind of things do you have linked in your Bitmoji classroom? Um, you know, I have, for example, I have um, an iPad that has a link to our PowerSchool information. I have um, my bookcase is linked to um, Word reference. So like students are able to be in the classroom and be able to get to things that they would sort of normally want to have access to as they're, you know, going through and doing their work for me. Um, I also will be adding more links for, um, you know, videos and such that they could watch um, as well. So lots of great ideas of things to be able to, to link and, and have in there. Do you see yourself continuing to do this when we get back into school? Uh, I actually Physically do. Physically normal? <laughs> it's be a lot of fun. You know, one of the things that I'm also going to be doing as I build this is you know, our daily can do statements will be on the on the whiteboard, if you will, so that students can see that so they can be updated each day. So it does have that similar feeling to being actually in class. 
Great. Yeah, my friend, my colleague Robin said that she saw herself using that more um, also in assigning homework as, you know, providing this kind of like consistent systematic way of, of providing homework for students so that they go into different places in her Bitmoji classroom and it, it, it's providing with them with some consistency. Any other comments, questions, ideas? I think that's it for the moment. Okie dokie. Uh, the next topic that I've heard a lot of people talking about is how adapting their teaching to distance learning has really reinforced the importance of planning with a lot of focus and purpose. And I know that for different districts, distance learning looked different in so many ways, whether or not you continued to grade, whether the workload was reduced or remained the same, whether you're having um, meetings with students or not, whether or not you were expected to continue with the curriculum as normal or no new learning. But you know, across the board, what I've heard from all of the teachers I've spoken with is that it's really taught them to be more focused and purposeful with their learning. Um, a couple weeks ago, NECTVIL hosted a great webinar from Rebecca Blowolf, who is our current ACTVIL Teacher of the Year called We'll Always Have Paris. This is available on the NECTVIL website. And Rebecca shared some great strategies for how we can take our current units and our current curriculum and modify it so that it's more manageable during distance learning. But I would encourage people, if you haven't seen it already, to go back and watch that webinar because I feel like just in the same way her thought, she walks through her thought process about how we can chunk things up into more manageable pieces. It applies back the other way as we go back to normal to think about how we're making really careful choices about what we teach and how we teach it. And so I would highly recommend that people watch that webinar if you haven't already. Uh, in terms uh, of, of planning terms from, of, like, yes. I'm getting my voice echoing back. In terms of planning, this distance learning process has really taught me to be even more focused on backwards design. So really thinking, what are the outcomes I'm hoping to get within a specified time period? How am I going to know whether or not students have met those goals? And then what are the different learning activities that I'm going to ask of my students to help support them as they move towards that? So sticking to that backwards design model has really helped me maintain focus and purpose with my planning. Um, if you've ever heard me speak before, you know that I'm a very big advocate of student choice. I feel that when we offer students the opportunity to choose how they're learning and how they're showing their learning, they become much more engaged in what they're doing and they're much more willing to self-differentiate for themselves. And this is something that I've heard a lot from several of my colleagues that through distance learning, they were encouraged to offer students choice. We saw a lot of different types of choice boards offered out on the internet and on Twitter. Um, and I've heard a lot of educators talk about how empowering it was to give students choice. Uh, Vanessa is a colleague of mine and she's, I'm like a proud mama, she's a, a pretty much a first year teacher and she has just adapted and run with this so beautifully and she's talked about how in some of her different assignments she had many different ideas and ended up just giving students choices in what they were going to do and she found that to be so empowering and so engaging for her students and even how students might typically revert to some of the same production modes, like always doing a video, self-challenge themselves to try something new in subsequent assignments. And so she found offering them choices became very engaging um, for them. Uh, Robin Bertrand, who's also another colleague I work with, she's the one who did the Bitmoji classroom, talked about how she embedded different types of choice activities into her Bitmoji classroom and she was really excited to see excited. how excited students got about engaging with that. 
Uh, something else that Vanessa also talked a lot about was how this time taught her to be even more comprehensible in her input. It really helped her to focus on choosing what kind of input she was giving to her students through distance learning and how to make that as comprehensible as possible. And she also spoke about how she began to explore a variety of strategies like being very purposeful. And I think a lot of this is stuff we already know, but this is just an important reminder of it, of, of providing a lot of imagery, a lot of modeling. And one of the things that she said to me that she found, I found to be very insightful was that if she couldn't find a way to model it and make it comprehensible, it wasn't worth using. And I thought that was a really insightful comment. And um, that kind of um, brings me to something else I've heard a lot of people say or, or uh, complain about, lament about. And this is something I talked about in the webinar a couple weeks ago, and this was the Google Translate problem. I've heard a lot of teachers express concerns during distance learning about students using different types of translators. And my response to that and the response I've heard from some other educators is, if we go back to planning with focus and purpose, we can provide um, the structures that will prevent students or will, will dissuade students from even needing to go to that in the first place. And so for me, an important piece of that is to establish a culture of risk taking, to let your students know, and I think this is a culture we can even establish from the very beginning of the school year, that mistakes are okay and that taking risks and experimenting with language and being open to making mistakes is an important piece of the language learning process. Also talked about invoking your inner Goldilocks. And this is about talking about what that just right place is for students. And this is something my colleague Vanessa, I think, discovered is finding that spot of comprehensible input and what she's asking students to do to be just the right level of challenge for her students not too hard and not too easy. When we start to make it too hard, that's when they're going to turn to Google Translate. When we're asking them to do things, they're just not ready to do yet. We also need to make sure that we're providing a lot of modeling through comprehensible input and empowering students to know it's okay to use dictionaries when appropriate. Um, something Rebecca Blowwolf shared with me a couple months ago was how she asks students when they're doing different types of prompts, she kind of tells them it's okay to look up a certain number of words, but she asks them to actually highlight the words that they've looked up so that they're taking, showing some integrity for what they did need a dictionary to look up. And so I think empowering students to know when it is okay to use an online dictionary supports that. And then finally, um, I think it's important that we respond with compassion. And so um, I occasionally do have students who I know have translated sentence structures and I, instead of, you know, punishing them or giving them a zero or, or yelling at them, I more just respond in the sense of, I noticed that you used Google Translate here. This, this is where you could have looked for the resources that you needed to do this assignment. If you struggled with it again, um, let me know. And so I find that if we can kind of focus on these things, both during distance learning and beyond, we will reduce that tendency to turn to Google Translate that we see often, I think, many educators. So how does this kind of all come together? Um, Michelle Ola gave a webinar for NACTFL several weeks ago, and she made some great points that I loved, and I'd asked for permission to share this, this quote from her. But she said to really how important it was to start with a vision. So at the end of X period of time, they will be able to X so that they can. And just making sure that you really have that clear vision. And then Jimmy didn't know I was stealing this from him, but um, uh, Jimmy talked a couple weeks ago in a meeting that we had about how he's doing a lot of work with just chunking things up and making it more manageable for students during this time of distance learning. But I think that's something that we need to remind ourselves of even when things do go back to normal, how we can chunk things up into manageable bits, make it reasonable what we're asking students to do and also making it relevant to them. And then 
being very purposeful in the learning activities that we give our students and what we're asking them to do in order to meet our goals. And I think for some of us, this might mean letting go of some old activities that we've created that don't really have a purpose anymore. Um, you know, things, I, I, I don't want to necessarily give any specific examples, but looking at what are some of those activities that we might be asking students to do, whether they're, you know, verb conjugation diagramming that are repetitive activities that might not necessarily have a purpose to meet the goals. And, and if there are things that we can just kind of let go of because they're not serving an important purpose in reaching those goals, like Michelle mentioned. And finally, um, making sure that we're providing the supports that students need to reach that vision that we have for them. So that's authentic input, providing scare, careful scaffolding. I'm a big advocate for choice and, and then giving them the feedback that they need to continue to grow towards those goals. And feedback is something I'm going to um, talk about in a few minutes. And so, sorry. Before I do, I wanted to I pause and get some input from from Jimmy and Nathan, if you have any thoughts or ideas or if there's anything in the chat. Sure. Well, we had a couple of questions related to choice. Um, the first one is beyond providing choice boards, are there other ways that you provide choice to your students? I love offering students choices. Um, my tendency is to not offer choice boards, but in instead to be clear about what students need to do or need to show me that they are able to do, and then telling them I don't care how they do it as long as they meet that criteria. And so an example might be to, um, you know, if you take a really typical kind of traditional unit of of preparing to take a trip someplace, I might tell my students, you need to tell me where you want to go and why, what the weather's going to be like there, what you're going to do there, and then what you need to pack for that trip. And I'll tell them, I don't care how you show me any of that stuff, you just need to be able to talk about those things. And I think for students who are used to having their hand held and having their creativity kind of stifled because we give them too much structure that they have to follow, you know, too many bullets that they have to check off. Giving them that open choice at first can kind of be overwhelming or hard for students. And so my students will come back and they'll say, can I do a PowerPoint? And I'll say, you can do anything you want as long as you show me X, Y, and Z. And they'll come back and say, can I do a movie? I'll say, you can do anything you want as long as you can show me X, Y, and Z. And when you kind of free them to do whatever they want, they can actually get quite creative and become pretty deeply engaged in their learning. So it's for me, it's been very fun to watch that process. Rebecca, we also have had questions, questions about ways of assessing with uh, Google Translate being so um, easy to uh, have students access stuff. What are some ways that we could assess students um, in a remote way? Yes. Um, I feel going back to, um, and I'll just go back to my slide on that. I think it comes back to some of these steps. I don't necessarily think we need to change the ways that we're assessing students. So if you're assessing through a Seesaw or through a Google Doc or you know whatever different ways that you might be assessing students, just think really carefully about what you're asking them to do and are you asking them to do something that you've prepared them to do? And then have you provided the scaffolding necessary for them to do that? For me, a lot of that is stepping away from expecting perfection from students um, at the level I teach, which is, you know, the novice level, it means my students are constantly told 
you don't have to answer this in a full sentence if you're not ready to do that yet. And so empowering students to know that what I'm looking for them is for them to be able to communicate around a certain point. I'm looking to see, can they communicate their point? And if they can, whether that's in sentences or in list of words, and they've, they've communicated what I've asked them to do, then they're meeting my criteria. And I think building up the culture around that reduces the likelihood that they'll turn to Google Translate. And I'm not saying it's going to completely get rid of it, but when I ask students to do something and they're using sentence structures that I know I've never taught them, I know they've used Google Translate. Now, if they're using the sentence structures that we have been working with, chances are they, they haven't used Google Translate, although it, it's possible they still could. I don't know if that helps to answer the question. I think that's great, thank you. Okay, any other questions or did you guys have any input on, on the, the, the planning piece? Uh, there was a um, just a nuts and bolts sort of one about what are some examples of choices that you might give a second grade class? <laughs> um, I think it would depend on, you know, when I've taught second grade, it's been in very, very short time chunks. You know, so seeing the students about 20 minutes a week. And so I didn't necessarily do a lot of the bigger project-based learning. I have with students as young as third or fourth grade allowed them, when I had longer time periods, allowed them to choose different learning stations for the day. And so some of the choices that they might have around a common theme would be to be doing some question cards with a peer that have true-false questions or um, giving them an option to go to a center where there are iPads and they can listen to a video, giving them centers where they might be using whiteboards to respond to things. So, so those are some of the choices that I might give for a second grade. Great, thank Nathan, you. do you have any input on that one? Well, I have to say for the younger levels, I, I have to be really cautious about giving too much liberty I like giving liberty and justice and all that, but <laughs> for the really young ones, they need a lot of hand holding and they need really concrete directions. So I might, like you said in your earlier example, give a couple of suggestions that are kind of or the same general thing and they express themselves however they choose with that. But I think if it's too open ended, they just go haywire. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, I've if if I were to have a more consistent had have had a more consistent um, contact time with second graders, you might be able to create more of a culture with routines and and the expectations. But you know, for me in my experience working with the younger grades, it's been push in for a very small amount of time, and so it's hard to set up some of those structures and routines that might facilitate more independence from the little guys. Definitely, definitely. Rebecca, one more Anything question else before I move on. Yes. Move on. Um, when you are giving students choice, is there one rubric that you're using for that, or are you creating a different rubric for each of those activities? I do one rubric, and if anybody um, has questions about that or would like me to share some of the rubrics, you can send me an email. I'll share my email again at the end. But what I typically have on my rubrics are a content goal. So what is it that students, what's the content students need to show me that they can do? And then there will be a proficiency goal. And I typically individualize the proficiency goal for students. And I'm not speaking so much as about a proficiency level because they're kind of all around the same level, but more about what a student might want to do to work on upping their proficiency level. And so that piece of it is personalized for students. But um, it's more just about they're expected to show me their knowledge and their skills around a certain topic, and they can show that to me in any way. I usually just have to be very specific about what it is they have to show me that they know and that they can do, and 
what kind of content they, I, you know, I, because typically they'll be speaking about something. I want them to show me some sort of imagery so that, you know, if they are talking about pants and they show me a, a water bottle that they really do know what that word for pants means. And so I typically will say you have to include some sort of imagery in it. There's just more about providing really clear, clear criteria, but that the same rubric would apply to any type of project. And as I said, I, I really um, wanted this to be interactive. And so if people have more questions or other people have ideas that you want to share out, I'm happy to hear them or I can keep going. I think you can go on. I'll keep going. OK, thank you, Nathan. So grading and feedback. I know this is another area that there's a great variety in districts in terms of what was expected of teachers and students. In my middle school, we stopped providing students with grades and we were directed just to give them feedback. Um, I know even at the high school levels, there was even even in a lot of districts where students were continuing to receive grades, there was a mandate that students' grades couldn't fall during this time or that teachers needed to be a lot more flexible with grading and more proactive with the feedback. And I found and a lot of the teachers that I spoke with this to be very powerful and I'm really excited to see how this shapes our practices as we move forward. Um, and I'll tell you in like the, the first two weeks after we we went into distance learning, I went into a team meeting. This actually quote came from a math teacher who comes into the meeting. She just goes, whoa, I, I, I give them feedback and they redo it. They fix things. And, and then they asked me if I'll look at it again, and then they get all excited about being able to fix their work. And I thought this was such insightful, it was so insightful of her to notice this and to watch this happen, because for me, this is really what learning should be about. It should really be about how can I learn from my mistakes? How can I continue to push myself forward? How can I fix what I've done and make it better? And um, so it was so exciting to, to hear this from her. And this is what I've heard consistently from a lot of language teachers that as they've made this shift to feedback, um, they find that students are moving past just compliance. I find that it's really hard to give grades that aren't about compliance. Did you turn it in on time? And did you meet all of the little check boxes on what I've given you as a rubric or in the assignment? Or did you answer all the questions right on the test? Um, but some of my colleagues talked about how this really shifted their focus away from just focusing on the mistakes that students were making and going through and grading and correcting every little piece of students' work. and instead helped focus them more on what's going to push students to improve their proficiency level. And so as um, some of the teachers I spoke with talked about how they really stopped looking for mistakes in what students were doing and instead focused on what they were doing well in terms of developing their proficiency and what they needed to do to continue to move on. And I know there are a lot of people who have already been doing a lot of great work in this. Um, but it, it's been very refreshing to see what a wake up call this was for so many language teachers. Uh, several of my colleagues who I spoke with talked about how this motivated their students to want to continue to do better, to, to look for ways that they could continue to improve. And I also feel that as we make this shift, it helps to facilitate uh, self reflection. And I, I, I know Rebecca Blowwolf is out there listening because I see she's she's tweeting, but um, I've learned a lot from Rebecca about this. And Rebecca has shared a lot about this on Twitter, about how you can provide students with feedback using proficiency-based rubrics and then even asking them to begin to self-reflect using the same terminology and the same language that you've been using to give them their feedback. So um, some of the feedback strategies, I, I just mentioned Rebecca Blowwolf and I, I stole from Twitter something she posted, which was a rubric where I love how she uses this language of glows and grows. So looking at the, the rubric and, and proficiency descriptors, what the student has done very well, so their glow and their grow, what they need to do to keep shooting up higher. 
And this is something that Rebecca shared with me several months ago, and I began to implement it in my classes. And by me providing them feedback in these terms, it then empowered students to be able to do it for themselves. And this is something my colleague Vanessa has started to do with her students and has found it to uh, be really powerful. I also love Seesaw for giving feedback for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that students can go back and see it, but I can then also go back and see it anytime. You know, if you give students feedback on a piece of paper and then you hand back that piece of paper, chances are that piece of paper is going to be lost in the bottom of the locker pretty quickly. But when it's in Seesaw, it's saved there. And it's also a journal that you can go back and look at anytime. And so I really like that aspect of it. Uh, my colleague Vanessa was telling me that she uses Screencastify and um, we'll see how long her sanity lasts with this, but she takes her students' summative works and reviews it, but Screencastifies herself as she's reviewing their work and giving them feedback. And so she goes through and circles and highlights different parts of the student work. And I thought that was really remarkable. Um, and she does have over 100 students and an infant at home. And so the fact that she's managed to pull this off is quite remarkable. Um, but she found that students were really responsive to the feedback and they were then using it later in some of their, their subsequent work. And so I wondering if there's any comments or thoughts on feedback and, you know, I, I imagine Nathan, teaching in the elementary grades, you've probably already been more focused on standards and feedback. I, I'm wondering what that kind of looks like across the spectrum. Well, for me, uh, we are an ungraded subject, and instead on our students' okay. progress reports, they have indicators. There's probably five indicators for the lower grades and maybe 10 indicators for the upper grades, all proficiency-based, and it's really just a refreshing modality to live in to not have students hung up on the grades and instead to really focus on their capabilities so i love it <laughs> yeah I, I really do too um you know I, I i i keep complaining to my administrators that grading is just about compliance it's all about compliance um so it'll be interesting because i i, I think you know students do need to learn responsibility and there's many many factors it's um, feedback certainly takes more time and more thought, but I think it is a more empowering. What about you, Jimmy? Um, well, it's interesting. We actually have a couple of questions that may address some of these these things. Um, one of them is, what advice do you have on giving feedback versus giving grades? Seeing as you've had a little bit of experience with that this spring, um, that's a question that we've had. Mm -hmm. um, if it were up to me, I would get rid of grades. I hate grades because I feel again, like I keep saying that they're more about compliance. And I realize that there are many implications of getting rid of grades. Um, and we probably, that's probably a whole different webinar, but I just find that feedback is so much more powerful. Um, what I typically do in, even under normal times is I do still have to give grades but my grades are tend to be more about um, the attempt to do work. And I also typically allow students to revise any sort of work that they do. For me, even on, because I'm, I'm expected to give formal traditional quizzes, for me, if, if something's important enough for me to put it on a quiz, it means I want students to learn it. And I think if they didn't learn it the first time, they deserve another chance to learn it. And that's just my philosophy. And so I feel like in the bigger spectrum, feedback serves that same role of helping them to learn much more than grades help them to learn. And so given that, how then would you report that progress on a traditional report card? And and that's a really great question. And that's a that's a challenge. Again, what I do is I allow students to revise any work for a better grade just because I have to report grades. So, so you know, a student completes a test or a performance assessment 
and I give them, I have to give them a grade. I give them a grade on it and I give them feedback on it and they have the option to revise it for a better grade if they want. And, you know, for me that then gives them an opportunity to learn what they didn't learn the first time. It also might be an opportunity for them to get a second chance when they slacked because they were up all night playing a video game or whatever. But ultimately my, my purpose is to teach them the language. And so if they need a little extra time to learn it, that's my philosophy. It might be kind of revolutionary for some. Uh, we have a question from somebody asking, um, what kind of advice would you give uh, in teachers giving feedback in terms of uh, encouraging their students to level up their language uses versus, versus just, you know, comments? Yeah, so I um, use a proficiency rubric that my students are introduced to from the beginning of the year, but you could really do it at any point. It's something that you could jump into. And so, and, and this is less about grading, it's more about feedback, but students have that rubric and it outlines, you know, the different functions of language. So speaking around a certain topic, but also the, also the different text types. So are they speaking in lists? Are they speaking in memorized phrases? And when I give students feedback, I'll say something referring back to that rubric. So I'll say something like, wow, you've done a great job of listing several words on this topic. What, what do you need to do to push it? And so if they look to the next column on the rubric, they'll see that the next step up from lists is to be able to use more memorized phrases. And so the my feedback is worded to the students in exactly those types of terms. And as they become more familiar with them, they're actually able to go and self-reflect themselves and say, I noticed I did this. If I want to level up, I need to do this because they're referring back to that rubric. and that. That to me has been really powerful to, to see with my students. Did that answer the question? It most certainly did. Yes, thanks. So one yeah. other question <laughs> okay. a couple of times, Rebecca, is what what suggestions do you have for getting students to speak, especially when we're talking about the distance learning um, environment and, and it, how do we get kids to engage and use their own language and, and produce that in a distance learning environment? I think um, the biggest challenge has been interpersonal speaking. And in my district, we weren't really allowed to require students to come to virtual classes. So it was very hard to find ways to facilitate interpersonal speaking tasks. In terms of more presentational speaking, I find that Seesaw is a very useful tool for that. And even in our, in our, we use Google Meet in my district, even in our Google Meet, I can, you know, ask students questions and, and get them responding. But you're right, or the, the person posing the question is correct, that it's very hard to get students who, you know, I work with middle school students who don't want to see their face in a video and they much less want to hear them themselves trying to talk. Uh, I found it was a lot easier to do when we were in the classroom. <laughs> that was probably a very lame answer. Don't you have the answer to that question, Jamie? I don't think anyone has a, a great answer to that. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think we're all grasping with the same, the same thing. We've had yeah. a couple of people send in suggestions as we've been chatting about this. One person said that they've used Flipgrid um, as a way of getting students to record a message, um, not necessarily interpersonally, but presentationally. Um, another one is having a, is recording a message and, and sending it, but again, not necessarily that interpersonal communication. Right, right. All right, and um, I had a couple more topics to cover, but I'm I'm delighted that you know there have been some good questions because that was ultimately my my goal for today would be to get some interaction. I'll just kind of wrap up with um, one more topic that I wanted to talk about, and that was this this idea of teaching the whole student. And again, I think this is just good teaching practice, but I feel that distance learning has really 
um, reminded of this of this, that we need to make sure that we are being empathetic to our students and who they are and what their needs are. Um, you know, I, I, I think about this, this box of the student and what the student is and the meetings and the conversations I've had with colleagues in my building, on my team, but all the way, you know, uh, Leanne Tarada, who's, who's here, I think she's listening in, is in Colorado. And the questions that I'm hearing people asking about students during distance learning are questions we need to make sure that we're continuing to ask them about them even when things go back to normal. So these are questions like what's going on at home? We have students now who aren't completing work because they're staying home taking care of younger siblings. That's not necessarily going to change when we go back to school and so we need to make sure that we continue to be empathetic to those kinds of situations. Asking questions like how does a student learn best? What kind of supports does this student need? These are questions that we've been asking ourselves weekly as students are flagged as concerns during distance learning. And we need to make sure that we continue to ask these same questions about our students because the challenges they face and who they are aren't necessarily going to change when we go back to school. Even questions like, is this student okay? You know, and I think when we have a student who struggles either behaviorally or with work completion, we have a tendency to fall into this mode of responding with consequences. Well, they'll just get a zero for it, or you know, it's a detention or whatever. But I think we need to keep coming back to reminding ourselves that these are our are, are little people. No matter what age you're teaching, even the 18 year olds, they're still young people and we still need to remind ourselves to ask, is this student okay? And there's been a lot of questions about equity and equitable access during distance learning that have focused around you know, technology access and internet access, but also having the proper supports at home, particularly with the younger kids who need to have an adult around making sure they're doing their work. These, these issues don't go away even when things go back to normal. And we need to make sure that we're continuing to ask those questions. And um, Michelle Ola gave a great webinar that was about planning during Corona, but she also talked a lot about these issues in that uh, webinar. So I'd encourage people to listen to it. Um, and I know we, we need to wrap up very soon, but I don't know if anybody else had any comments or strategies that you wanted to share around that piece. Uh, one quick last question before we have to depart. Uh, somebody's asking about how you build a close virtual learning community despite the you know, distance, uh, mm -hmm. during distance teaching. Um, <laughs> I think we need to, you know, when, when I think of my middle school classroom and my middle school day, um, my day typically starts with I have a big window that overlooks where the buses unload and I got into this routine in the mornings of standing in the window and waving to my students as they were getting off the buses and then you know they come in and they pop into my classroom and they're saying oh I saw you open the window or why did you forget to go to the window today and were you in the bathroom again um, and and you know wanting to come in during lunch and so I think as much as you know the those virtual meetings are such uh, sacred time in terms of trying to pack as much instruction into them as we can, we need to make sure that we're giving time for that. And so as students start to trickle into the virtual meetings, like, how are you doing? And, and you know, letting them show off their cat to you and asking what the cat's name, uh, you know, just making those kinds of personal connections. I also ask my students at the end of every single meeting, is everybody doing okay? Is there anything I can help you with? Is there anything you need? Um, and just asking those questions, I think showing that we care beyond our subject is really important to that community piece. And I'm going to skip ahead to my end as we wrap up. Fantastic. All right, well, Rebecca, thank you so much for that. And I'm going to turn it over to John. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for that very informative presentation. And thank you, Nathan and Jimmy, for moderating. 
There were probably a lot of burning questions that weren't answered, but Rebecca, I see you've shared your Gmail address and you're okay with people contacting you? Absolutely, please do. Okay, great. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, it has been recorded and the recording will be made available on our website tomorrow. New York State teachers who need proof of attendance for CTLE credit, please use the links provided at nectful.org slash webinars. Teachers in other states may use the same links, but please consult your local school district and or state regulations regarding documenting your PD hours. On behalf of the NECFL Board of Directors, thank you for attending this afternoon's webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day and evening. Bye-bye, Rebecca. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.